Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. If you are new here and you like true crime, I think you're in the right place. My name is Miranda Hunley and I like to talk about true crime. And before we get started, I want to introduce Fahey. So I started making these cool little planters and I am just so proud. She is beautiful. I make up these like little backstories with her and I give all my plants a name from one of the true crime stories that I've done. So this is Fahey from the Anne Marie Fahey video that I am definitely going to redo because the audio is all messed up. So uh, don't go check that one out. But I just wanted to introduce her. My sister said I should start making YouTube shorts about how to make these. And I think that's a pretty good idea. They're really fun, easy. If I can do it, you definitely can do it. But um, I just want to introduce her. She's beautiful. So I am doing all 50 states and today I am on Mississippi. It is the case of Emmett Till and I did not know who Emmett Till was until I was in college and to me that blows my mind. Everyone should know this case. This is a huge thing in history. Like this case made history. It's still being talked about to this day. They just made a movie about it. It is called Till. Um, it's on Redbox, Amazon Prime, and a couple other streaming services. It's not on Netflix, and it's not on Hulu. I haven't watched it yet because it's not on Netflix or Hulu, but I definitely do want to rent it and check it out. But this story that I'm doing, I went through all the trial transcripts. I went through interviews with Mamie Till, who is Emmett's mother. And I just went really in deep with it because I did do a research project in college about it. I'm not going to lie. It was kind of half-assed like most of my college work, unfortunately. But as I like dug into this, it's just insane after insane after insane. And the craziest part, and I want to say this at the beginning so you can remember this throughout the whole story, is that the person who is responsible for Emmett Till's death is still alive to this day. And she is living in Kentucky. All right, so let's get started. Also, before I start, I really need to give a trigger warning because there are very, very graphic photographs that I will be adding into this video. And it's a child. And I just know it's really hard to look at. It's hard for me to look at, but I think I owe it to Emmett Till's mother who said, let them see what they did to my son. I think I owe it to her to add these pictures into the video because we really need to see the severity of what happened to her son. Emmett Till was born July 25th, 1941, and he had a pretty rough birth. He was breached, but as soon as he got out, he was full of life. He was always giggling and smiling, and he was a huge mama's boy. He was his mother's only child, so he got quite a bit of attention and he was just overall ornery like he loved playing with fireworks but he was just goofy and he loved making people laugh that was his personality Emmett grew up in Chicago and he did go to a segregated school but he grew up in a fairly wealthy neighborhood I believe it was called like a working neighborhood back then because his mother was a college educated single mom and she was African American so this was a huge thing they were very highly respected in Chicago although segregation was still kind of a thing which is so crazy to think about like they couldn't drink out of the same water fountains as a white person and like the water fountains for the black people weren't in the same places as a water fountain for a white person. It was like for every four water fountains for a white person was one for a black person and people would just throw garbage in it and just treat it with disrespect. Like I, I hate learning about that type of stuff, but we are not like generations and generations and generations away from this. Like this is the type of stuff our grandparents dealt with and I don't know, just crazy. Sorry, sidetrack. Anyways. Emmett Till. So Emmett's family was from Mississippi and Emmett had never gone to Mississippi to see that side of the family. And this summer, his cousins really wanted him to come down. They kept talking about it and he just wanted to experience it firsthand. And his mother kept telling him like, no, Emmett, the South is a lot different 
from Chicago. In Chicago, and they can walk the streets and may hear something here and there and still have that whole segregation feeling towards it, but it wasn't like down south. If you were black down south, you couldn't talk to a white person without being talked to. You couldn't shake hands. You couldn't, you know, give a fist bump. Like, you couldn't do that type of stuff with a white person. It was basically like you had to act like you didn't exist. And it's just, it's so disgusting. But Emmett wanted to experience that firsthand. And his mother gave him a lot of talks. Like, you need to say yes, sir, and yes, ma'am. You have to, you know, move over on the sidewalk if white people are walking towards you. And she really pushed in, like, this is a dangerous place for a young black boy. And Emmett, you know, said he understood. And after a lot of persuading from Emmett and Emmett's cousin, Mamie Till let her son go. But she was worried sick the entire time. Emmett, however, was so excited and they're walking to the bus station and Emmett starts running towards his bus. And Mamie is like, excuse me, where is my kiss goodbye? And it does the whole, oh, mama type deal. And and he goes, he gives his mom a kiss and he gives her his wristwatch. And Mamie is like, what about your ring? Emmett wore his father's ring and it was way too big on him. But his father passed away when Emmett was about four years old because he was accused of raping a woman while he was in the service. Emmett's father, who was named Louise, was charged with domestic violence against Emmett's mother, and he got the choice of prison or to serve in the military. So he chose to serve in the military. While he was overseas, he got accused of rape and had a hanging. Emmett's mother knew nothing about it until about 10 years after Emmett's death. They just wouldn't tell her why her ex-husband, the father of her child, was hung. So Emmett said, no, you're not taking my ring. I want to show this off. And Mamie said, all right, I'll see you in a couple days. And on August 20th, 1945, Emmett arrived in Mississippi. Money, Mississippi, to be exact. Emmett was having a great first couple of days. Then on August 24th, 1955, Emmett was playing in a cotton field with his cousins and they get pretty thirsty. So they decide to go to a convenience store. His cousins go and get something to drink and then they come out and then Emmett's like, oh wait, I want bubble gum. So he goes in there and he's getting bubble gum. He goes to hand the money to the cashier and she has her hand out like this. Emmett has the 10 cents in his hands and he does that and hands it to her. Now in Money, Mississippi in the 50s, if you were a person of color, you were supposed to put the money directly on the counter and let the cashier grab it and scoot it back. You weren't supposed to touch them or make any type of like physical contact. So she jerks her hand back and she's like, excuse me? Well, she wants to shut down the whole shop because of this. And she goes out to her car to get a gun. Emmett's already on the sidewalk with his cousins. He doesn't think anything of it because in Chicago, that's not how it was. So he was just like, what is her deal? What is she doing? And he whistles. Like adding fuel to the fire, Emmett. But there's conspiracy around his whistle. There was uh, a couple of black people playing chess in the direction that he was whistling. And some people say they thought he was whistling like, hey, I want to play winner. <laughs> and then also Emmett had a very bad stutter. So his mother taught him to kind of go, to kind of do a breathing exercise before he talked to calm himself down to control his stutter. And then, of course, there's he was whistling at the woman. Now, his cousins were there. I watched an interview and his cousin said it was a wolf whistle, like, ow, ow, type deal. 
So most likely he was trying to whistle to make his cousins laugh. And it just it wasn't happening in the South at this time. So she's straight panicking. And Emmett and his cousins like Superman into the car and they start speeding away. And she is chasing them. Why is she just she's so scared? Why is she chasing them? Anyways, they jump out of the car. They start running through a cotton field. They start tripping over each other. Like, they are full-on panicking. And the car just drives by. So, they think they're safe. They go home. Emmett is saying, hey, please don't tell Uncle Moe's about this. Please don't tell anybody, really. Just don't tell anyone about this. He was so embarrassed. But the whole town knew about it by dinner time. And everyone kept saying, this ain't the last you're going to hear about it. That fat little Chicago boy whistled at Carolyn Bryant. And Carolyn Bryant was this teeny tiny Irish girl. She was newly married. She was 21. And she was married to the owner of the store. Her husband's name was Roy. And really, they were not shit, to be honest. Like, they were poor. They were mooching off Roy's older brother, JW, and they were living in the store. So I don't know why they, like, I don't know what high horse they were on. Days pass, and it was, like, pretty quiet. So they thought things kind of slowed down a little bit. Like, the, the town was still kind of, like, jibber-jabbering about it. But Roy and JW did not forget about it. August 28th at 2 a.m., Roy and JW show up at Moses' house asking for Emmett. JW has a flashlight and he's shining it in Moses' face. He also has a gun. And Roy is screaming, this is Mr. Bryant. You better open up. Moses is like, okay. He opens up. They storm in. They're looking for Emmett. They're going to each bedroom. This wakes up Moses' wife. And she is offering the money. Like, please, I'll pay you for the damages. Just forget all about this. Leave Emmett alone. They get to Emmett's room and they're screaming, are you the one that whistled out my wife? Blah, blah, blah. And Emmett's like, yeah. And they say, you don't talk to me like that. And Emmett's cousins are like saying, yes, sir. No, sir. This family is trying to fight back, but they're threatening to shoot them. They hold the gun up to Moses and ask, how old are you? Moe says, I'm 65, sir. And they say, if you want to reach your next birthday, you ain't going to call the police about this. They tell Emmett to get dressed. Emmett's getting dressed. He's putting his socks on. They say, just put your shoes on. Don't put your socks on. Emmett says, I don't wear shoes without socks. And they swoop him up. They are not having his disrespect. Disrespect? You just broke into their house trying to steal a kid. But whatever. Moe's is standing on the porch and Emmett gets put in a car and he, and he hears JW and Roy ask, is this the kid? And they hear a female voice say, yes, it is. And then the car drives off and Moe stands on the porch for 20 minutes. He realizes they're not coming back after an apology. They're not coming back after they find out if this is the kid or not. So he goes back in and him and the rest of the family are staying awake, waiting for Emmett to come back. Which Roy and JW did say they were going to bring him back. I, I don't think that the family believed that. But they stayed awake and then... I, 6 a.m. they start driving around looking for Emmett or Roy or JW. They're looking for somebody. And they don't find anybody, so they call the police. They tell the police everything that happened. And on August 29th, Roy and JW get arrested. And it's not a normal arrest. They didn't get put in handcuffs. Roy was allowed to finish up at the shop, and then go take a shower and change into comfier clothes before they go to jail. When they get to jail, they admit to the kidnapping. They admit to everything that they said, but they admitted to everything that Moe's had told the police. 
but they said at 6 a.m. they dropped Emmett back off at the convenience store that he whistled at Carolina. On August 31st, a uh, boy was fishing with his dad and he's like walking around the riverbank and he smelled something funny. But as he's walking, he sees knees and like the shin and a foot floating on top of the water. So he goes and gets his dad and his dad goes to call the police. They stand there and watch this body get pulled out of the river. As they're pulling the body out of the river, the neck is connected to a fan by barbed wire. And this is not just like a little desk fan. This is a big, heavy metal, 76 pound industrial fan. This body is swollen from the water and it almost does not look like a body. Like it it's disgusting and again i'm going to give a trigger warning because coming up i will be showing you pictures of the body and it is so hard to look at mose comes down to the river and identifies it the only way mose could identify the body was by emmett's father's ring that he was wearing September 2nd, the sheriff ships the body back to Chicago to Mamie Till and tells her, you better have it in the ground by nightfall. Which is so disrespectful, inappropriate, heartless, and I hope that he spent the rest of his life very ashamed and embarrassed to say that to a mother. Well, Mamie goes to check out the body to identify it and they said that they couldn't show it to her. And she said, well, I paid a lot of money for this funeral and I want to see if that is actually my son. And they were like, well, we can't open it. We are not allowed to open it. So she said, well, you got a hammer? They said, no, ma'am. And she said, well, if you ain't opening it, I'm opening it. So they tell her to go home and they will call her once they figure out a way to open the casket. And she goes home, and very shortly after she gets home, they call her back and says, hey, come here, we open the casket. She gets there, and the way she describes her son is so heartbreaking. As she's walking up to the funeral home, she said that there is, like, a terrible smell. She thought there was, like, a sewer break or something, and that ended up being her son's body. And before... I put the pictures on the screen. This is your third trigger warning. It is bad. Emmett's tongue was pulled out and over his chin, touching his neck. Emmett's left eye was dangling down. His right eye was completely missing. He only had two teeth in his mouth. His ears were gone. There was a bullet hole at the top of his head, like right above his ear. And the back of his head was cut in half with an ax. His nose had been smashed to nearly non-existent. His neck was mangled from the barbed wire being tied to it. And he had whips all along his body. On top of all of this, his body was very swollen from being waterlogged in the water for three days. The funeral home director assumed she wanted a closed casket and he said something about it and she said, no, this is gonna be an open casket. They need to see what they did to my son. He asked if she wanted any reconstruction makeup and she said, nope, don't touch it. And that had to be very hard. Something that she could, she couldn't bear to see, and she was willing to see it over and over and over again for the rest of her life in order to make a change. And she saw it on newspapers, she saw it on the news, she saw it at the funeral, and at the funeral, over 10,000 people showed up, and people were fainting after seeing Emmett's body.
it makes me kind of disgusted because I feel like there are people out there who are like, oh, let's go see the mangled dead kid. Like, it's just, that's disgusting. It really is. But there's always weirdos out there. By the one sentence Mamie said, I wanted the world to see what they did to my baby was like one million speeches. This was a huge break in the civil rights case and really let the world see like America couldn't turn a blind eye anymore about how they were treating people because of the color of their skin. They had to look. They couldn't turn a blind eye. They couldn't stop listening. They couldn't tune it out. It was, this is happening, and this is happening to children. I truly believe by that selfless act of Mamie Till, a lot of lives were saved. On September 19th, 1955, the trial of Roy and J.W. started. Roy Bryant and J.W. Milam. As the trial is starting, people are sending money to Roy and J.W. for their lawyer fees. Like, people were donating to their GoFundMe, essentially. And Mamie Till was getting hate mail. She said her mailbox was, like, stuffed full every day of mail saying, that's what your son gets, and you should have raised him with a little more respect, and just all this disgusting stuff. And, oh, my gosh. People, it makes me want... It makes me like lose hope in humanity, but I know that we are progressing not nearly as fast as I want us to progress. If you don't believe me, go check out my video about Earl Moore Jr. He got murdered by paramedics, racist paramedics. So just recently in 2004, they decided to release the transcript of this trial. And I am telling you, it is cringy. And it's very long. I kind of just skinned it up to all the fuckery. First off, the jury was all male and all white male. So first, Uncle Mose is getting, like, cross-examined. And he is getting questioned because... And I never... I never found out the lawyer's name for Roy and... JW. So I'm just going to say the lawyer and like the prosecutor. But the lawyer was questioning like, well, if JW had a flashlight in your face, how did you tell it was them? And Moses is like, because I know them. And they said their names. And then the, the lawyer was like, it could have been anybody just saying it was Roy and JW. And Moses is like, they were rummaging through my house. I caught glimpses of them. And like the lawyer was like, you're lying. Then they call the homicide investigator to <laughs> get cross-examined. And the homicide investigator is like describing what he saw. And he said when they were pulling the body out of the river, the skull fell out and like fell into the river. And then he was like, and there was a bullet hole in the top of his head. And the lawyer was like, you can't say bullet hole. You don't know if it was a bullet hole. And so he was like, okay, well, what looked like a bullet hole? And they're like, you can't say what a bullet hole looks like. So then he's like, okay, a small hole above his ear, about half inch big. I'm like, why can't you say a bullet hole? Anyways, and then they call the sheriff to be examined. And he was like, I don't know. He could have been like swimming and then just got like tangled up in the barbed wire. And somebody could have like just thrown the fan to the bottom of the lake. And as he was swimming, he just got like tangled up. What about the bullet hole to his head and like the axe wound on the back of his head? I don't know. And like them listening to the sheriff say that but the, not letting the investigator say bullet hole I, I don't know that didn't make any sense to me but the sheriff is also the one that went to arrest the two boys well 
Roy and JW. He went to arrest Roy and JW and let them, like, finish their work day and get a shower and, like, powder up, like, whatever. So then Mamie Till gets put on the stand. And the first thing the lawyer says is, does he have life insurance? And she was like, yeah, $400 in life insurance. I got it for him when he was a baby. And they were like, oh, <gasps> she killed him for the life insurance. Like, what? If she took it out like a week before this happened, maybe it's suspicious. She kept saying things like, my son's tongue was pulled down and it was touching his neck. And then the lawyer would be like, the body's tongue. Like, they wouldn't let her say, my son. They kept dehumanizing Emmett Tell. Then came Willie, who was walking by. And he walked by, I he was going to a well. And I'm not entirely sure why he, like, kept going to this well and back. Um, but that's, it really doesn't matter. He kept going to a well. He walked by JW's house three times. First time he walked by, there were three white men in the cab of a truck and four black men in the back of a truck. And one of them was a very young looking guy who looked a lot like Emmett Till's picture that they kept showing to identify. So they were like, is this what that got, that boy looked like? And they're, Willie was like, yes. So probably Emmett Till. But he was sitting on the bed of a truck looking down. So Willie walked by, then when he goes back, they, the truck wasn't there anymore, but he heard screaming out of a barn in a lot of noises that he described as like whipping or punching sounds and screaming. So he just kept walking and then JW walks by and he had a gun strapped to his chest and he goes towards the barn. He did not see JW go in the barn. And the lawyer made sure he like asked that like 40 times. So then Willie is walking back to the well a little bit later and JW is walking away from the barn and the screaming was still going on. And this is around 7 a.m. in the morning. The lawyer then was like, how do you know it was whipping? <laughs> and Willie was like, and Willie is a black man, so... You know, he's trying to be as respectful as he can. So he said, because it sounded like whipping, sir. And the lawyer is like, objection. The judge was like, you're objecting the answer to your own question. And I just lost it at that point. I'm like, what the heck is wrong with this lawyer? Like, he's just not a, a good lawyer, but... Unfortunately, he did his job. And then as they're questioning, Carolyn, they keep calling Emmett a man. And Emmett was 14. He had turned 14 a month ago. So like 40 days before his murder, he was 13. Like He had just turned 14. They kept calling him a man. And that was driving me crazy. And then the last one that they were questioning that like just had me rolling my eyes was the pathologist. And this pathologist, I don't I don't think he even graduated high school. I don't know if he needed a college education back then, but he wasn't that smart because you can look at a body and say, you know, it got beat up pretty bad. But he was like, well, I can't really tell if it was a, a black guy. The only thing that makes me think that this was a black man was his hair. Okay, let's show the picture of Emmett on his deathbed again. You know, kind of obvious. But then he was saying, well, he could have been swimming and somebody threw the fan on top of him. And then the prosecutor was like, well, what about the hole in his head? The pathologist was like, well, I can't really tell if it's a bullet hole or not. What do you mean you're a pathologist and you can't tell if somebody was shot? But again, like I said, 
The lawyer did his job because on September 23rd, 1955, Roy and J.W. were found not guilty of the kidnapping and murder of Emmett Till. They were found not guilty because the pathologist said that you couldn't tell if that was Emmett Till or not. But eight and a half weeks later, Roy and J.W. sell their story to Look Magazine and confess to everything. And it was labeled the shocking story of the approved killing. That might be like the title of this video, actually. They talked about how they beat Emmett, shot him, tied him to a fan, and threw him in the river. And the last conversation Emmett Till ever had was J.W. asking, are you still as good as I am? Emmett Till saying, yeah. J.W. asking, do you still like white women? Emmett Till saying, yeah and then jw shot him and let him fall in the river with that fan on his neck carolyn confesses that emmett till did not threaten her all he did was touch her hand and whistle at her and she told her husband that he grabbed her he called her baby he asked her on a date emmett didn't do any of that she just wanted him killed because he touched her hand caroline then said nothing that boy did could justify what happened to him and like I said, Carolyn is still alive to this day in Kentucky. And I want so bad to put negative energy on her, but I don't. I'm not doing that. So I hope she has grown as a person. So the death of Emmett Till definitely pushed the people who were content on the sidelines of the civil rights movement to start fighting for civil rights and to the end of segregation. And... We have Mamie Till to thank because she could have easily said, I can't, I can't see this. I can't do this. This is too hard on me. But she didn't. She said, all right, we need to start fighting. We need to get rights. We need to be treated like humans. And that is the story of Emmett Till. If you like the story, please like subscribe and comment. I am very passionate about civil rights and just human rights. So when I learned about this story, I was like, why am I 21 learning about this? What on earth? But I just want to thank you all. And I wanted to give you guys just a little like exciting thing that I've been working on the Pike County massacre. If you guys have not heard about that, please go look that up. I have been working on this story for months now and the trial of Billy Wagner is about to start. I will publish that story once the trial is over because crazy stuff about it is coming out every single day. Um, I just, I was going to announce that at the beginning of the story, but I really wanted to jump into this Emmett Till story because I am just so, so passionate about it. Um, I love you guys. Thank you. Have a great day. Um, I am sending all this love and positivity to all of you. Mwah.